Pace, AKA Frank Ferragini. That's really my real name. Why am I here? I'm here to help you. Yeah, I'm here to help you grow your garden. I come here each and every week answering your gardening questions and also kind of sharing some insight <clears throat> into what possibly can be going on around your garden and maybe some of your neighbor's gardens or even what's going on in the gardening industry. If you have a garden question, just to let you know, if it's the first time that you're hopping on here, always pop on the comments and ask your question in the comments. Uh, no matter what platform you're watching me on for today, I will see those as well. The community here that joins us each and every week, lovely community, will also pop on and answer those questions as well. So we're all here. And even if you know the answer to some of those questions, go in the comments, go in the replies, tell them what you think and what your recommendations and your experience is. Because the whole idea of here is we're cultivating. We are growing. We are growing a better gardener, a better garden and better gardener. For those that don't know me, uh, I'm on breakfast television each and every morning from uh, 6 a.m. to approximately 10 a.m. Uh, that's where I'm wild about weather. I'm the weather forecaster, as well as I'm passionate about plants. My family have two garden centers, one in Bradford, one in Barrie, called Garden Gallery. If you love Christmas, you're going to love the garden galleries at this time of the year. Actually, right now, the amount of poinsettias that we have in color is unbelievable blow your mind. Go on my Instagram. You'll see some of the pictures that I shared there. Uh, good morning from Newfoundland. We already got a good shout out this morning from uh, The Rock this morning. Uh, good morning to you, Francis, as well. Good morning from Hamilton Mountain. Just let you know, I'll be traveling just past that today, Kathy Woods. I'm at Two Sisters Winery later this afternoon talking about home for the holidays. Going to do some outdoor Christmas uh, planters and be inspired by some of the wines that are there. Uh, this weekend has been busy for me. I was at the Fall Cottage Life Show on Friday, also yesterday at the Season Show, all at the International Center. And for those that won tickets here on this Garden q and it was great to see you all there. It was great to meet you all, and I thought you really, uh, I hope you enjoyed them. Uh, here we go from another question here. Good morning, Frankie from Barry, Debbie. Okay, let's talk a little bit about Barry. Let's talk a little bit about what is on the way. And what is on the way is really our first significant s snowfall. Janet, say good morning too from Curtis our first significant snowfall of this year. Areas like Barrie, uh, and I'm gonna speak specifically to Southern Ontario right now, even though I know we have viewers from right across the country, some in the United States, and even some that watch us from across the pond, this is some good information for you as well. This time of year, we tend to get what's called in the snow belt, what's called lake effect snow. Lake effect snow is generated by warm water temperatures, open waters, and cold air temperatures and the wind blowing across. Let me show you a little diagram here as well. I just pulled this up earlier, so I'm just gonna go to my Chrome tab here and show you this. So let me go share. So this is what uh, really the formation of lake effect snow looks like. And you can see there's many different diagrams, but take a look at the diagram on your right that's there. You can see there's the cold air that's gonna grow, uh, blow across that warm water. What you need is a difference of temperature between the water and air temperature of 13 degrees. If you have that and the lake itself or the body of water is approximately 100 kilometers wide, you're going to get lake effect snow. That lake effect snow will dump down heavy snow into many areas. And because the snow is oh so heavy, what happens is you're also going to have the effects of that snowfall on your garden. The issue that we have earlier on in the season with uh, heavier wet snow is that many of our evergreens have been firmed up. And what I mean by that is that we've gone through a period of really warm weather where they're still fairly living and alive. They're not, they're not, not frozen up. So as soon as uh, a plant gets chilled and or frozen, you'll find that the structure of that evergreen is much more tight. It's firmed up. Because it's not firmed up, specifically a lot of things like emerald cedars can see a lot of harm. So this morning, I encourage you, if you do have the time, to take some twine and go twine up some of those emerald cedars, especially if they're coming, if snow load would come off the home and fall on top of those, that will actually help them with that snowfall. If in these regions you do get a heavy wet snow, uh, later on when that snow is falling, and if you see some of the evergreens bending over, just go shake the snow off as well as you may find those beautiful hydrangeas that are right now are nice and dry, the PGs and maybe the Annabellas, those big flower heads, they can also be snow catchers and bend over and snap and break, and they can cause harm to the bottom of the plant. So sometimes pruning those off is a good idea. And a reminder, uh, macrophilias, which are your blues and your pinks, they only bloom 
on old wood. So if you're going to be removing flowers, just remove the flowers. Don't remove any growth whatsoever. So just keep an eye out for the heavy, wet snow. Snow is fantastic. You know, snow is a four letter word that a lot of people get upset about. Uh, but snow is something that provides moisture. So key in spring when it melts. So it's going to give us that. It provides insulation. It can actually be up to 10 degrees warmer underneath the snow than what it is with the air temperature. So some of the most harmful weather that we have in the winter is when we don't have any snow and we have cold, cold temperatures and clear days. That's when we get moisture loss. That's when we have a lot of plant loss as well because we just don't have any insulating factors that are out there. So let's give some other shout outs this morning as well. It's a little bit about the snow talk. Yeah, so this afternoon, uh, Barry could see 10 to 15 centimeters. Uh, even some other areas off the lakes could get up to 20 centimeters. Uh, Toronto today is going to get some light dustings of snowfall. Up through cottage country, 5 to 10 could easily be seen as well. Uh, we got Lynn. Good morning, Lynn. My garlic has grown about three inches in, the, in this great weather. Will they freeze? Thanks again for your help, Lynn. Uh, they will freeze a bit, but they'll be fine. So this is quite common that the garlic will go through this and it's not going to cause any harm. There's nothing that you should do. Like sometimes the, the thought is I'm just going to put more soil over the top of them. That's going to do more harm than help. So just let them be. Hopefully we get snow and that snow will really help them out as well. Uh, Chatham, big shout out to Chatham this morning and to Madeline. Uh, good morning to you too from Chatham. Uh, good morning from Bowmanville. Nice community in Bowmanville, just east of Toronto as well. Uh, good morning from Sutton off the shares of uh, Lake Simcoe. You could be into some lake effect snow today. Sutton, uh, Keswick could very be uh, much into some snow. Ancaster, shout out to you too, Jane Elizabeth. I was recently there, I think it was last week, with uh, the new tennis dome letter there. And I was there with um, with Breakfast Television. This week with Breakfast Television, I will be showcasing on Tuesday morning the Princess Margaret uh, Cottage that's up for uh, win, that is, if you buy a ticket. Donna saying good morning this morning from London. Uh, my good friend and fellow garden maintenance crew up there in uh, the area of cottage country, Suzanne Poff. Good morning, Frankie. I've been busy making a bunch of evergreen urns too. Tis the season. I really encourage you today, if you want to do Christmas urns and urn stuffers, uh, I would encourage you today because in Southern Ontario and, and the people that are watching me in Calgary uh, and Edmonton and in it through Manitoba and Saskatoon and areas of Saskatchewan, you're already frozen. You guys got lots of things that have been frozen. So it's, as you know, if you're doing greens and you're using containers outdoors and you're maybe putting them into the soil that's there, uh, when that soil freezes, then it becomes that much more work. So if you get a chance today, empty your containers today. That's the other thing that you really need to know. If you have plastic containers that are not doubled walled, if you have any clay containers outside and any, even concrete containers, if those are left with soil in, when soil freezes, it expands and that can crack the pots. So those pots should be emptied out. The soil should be emptied out. They should be turned oil over so no water can collect within them or even snow and then stored so they don't crack. So that's one thing that you can do. But I would encourage you, if you can't do your Christmas greens today, fortunately, I'm not going to get to be able to do that today. But tomorrow, I will be out there doing that for sure. Uh, Matthew Amos. Uh, hi, Frank. Hey, Frank. Nice to see you, Matthew, as well. Uh, here's another question that we have this morning from Wendy. When is the best time of year to cover strawberries with straw? I would encourage you to do it right now at this time of the year. That's going to actually insulate them a bit for uh, next season, for the spring season that's there. Um, as well, what the, the straw does is provide a little bit, it's a mulch, so it actually will reduce the weeding for you. Uh, and as well, what it will do is provide and also uh, maintain some of the moisture content that's there. Uh, don't use hay, always use straw. Straw is clean. Straw does not have weed seeds within it. Hay does. Um, hey, hey, hey. Uh, just going to have a little sip of coffee here. Hmm. Love strawberries. There are so many different varieties. And just to let you know as well, if you're seeing locally grown strawberries uh, at grocery stores and you're like, how the heck can that be? Uh, many greenhouse grown strawberries are happening right now in the province of Ontario. Lots. That's something that a lot of people are turning over to. Uh, Maria replying, which is good morning from Pickering. What zone is Pickering? So Pickering is generally a zone five to zone five B. So uh, anything that I would, I would select for you and it depends on where you are in Pickering. If you're closer to Lake Ontario, you'll be closer to a zone six because you'll get the microclimate of being closer to the lake. So the lake is always warmer in the fall and into winter because of the body of water. 
And then also just a little bit cooler in spring, but that actually increases the zone. That's where you get microclimates. So where else do we have microclimates? Well, you know that in Collingwood, if you're wondering why in Thornberry and a lot many areas around Collingwood, there's so many apples, there's a microclimate that's there. Niagara on the Lake, of course, surrounded by two lakes a little further south. Uh, another area where, you know, zone six to almost zone seven is what's grown. But P Pickering, I'd be confident with a zone five. And what you're selecting is plant material that's zone five, four, three, two, one. Anything, if it says it's it's hardy from zone five to zone nine, it's hardy for you. If it said to you, if it says on the tag it's hardy from zone six to zone nine, that's marginally hardy for you. If it says zone seven to zone nine, I would stay away. And even I would stay away from the zone sixes because it'd be marginally hardy. And that means sometimes it's an iffy plant for you to, to grow. Uh, here we go. How do I get rid of black knot on my cherry trees? So black knot, for people that do not know, is a disease and often happens to a lot of fruit trees as they get a little bit older. Black knot is a, a fungal disease that almost looks like a cancerous growth would be the best way to describe it on the tree itself. Can you cure the tree of black knot totally? No. Can we make the tree last longer? Yes. So we can prune out the black knot, making sure that you wipe your shears there after, after with a little bit of bleach to make sure we're not carrying that over. We can then use a dormant spray kit in early spring. Dormant spray kits are what we're going to use in early spring before the buds crack. So we're going to be using that in April when the air temperature is around five, day, four, five degrees above Celsius for at least uh, eight hours. Uh, that will be a treatment of horticultural oil. That horticultural oil will smother any insects that are there, not taking care of the black knot. But the lime sulfur that's there will actually clean up that tree and minimize the effects of black knot. I would probably recommend if it has a lot of black knot is to get rid of that cherry tree and start with another cherry tree if that's of your, of your pleasure, if that's something but you have to clean up that area quite a bit. But eventually that tree will die from black knot. Sorry about that. Uh, Lois, uh, good morning from a very snowy but beautiful Stratford. So Stratford already seeing the snow this morning. Uh, and so it, it, the snow is beautiful. Like, it, like I want to show you, uh, some heavy, wet snow. Let's show you some pictures of heavy, wet snow. Uh, let's show you what they do to us too. Oh, what am I doing here? I got to go to Chrome tab. Sorry about that guys. I think I just, I got to do this. Sorry. Chrome tab, heavy, wet snow, share. Boom. Yeah, so, you know, snow itself can be incredibly beautiful. But you can see the biggest challenge that we have with snow at this time of the year, and even with some of our deciduous trees, specifically a lot of willows, willows will still catch a lot of that heavy snow and bend down, and we'll see a lot of branches that will break. Uh, you know, you will maybe later on today or this afternoon or even this evening, got to get out there and shake off some of those evergreen branches and boughs so that they don't, just really lean over and really harm themselves overall. And those lean, those branches break, but indeed snow is beautiful. My talk that I did this week at uh, the fall cottage life show was a little bit about the winter garden and a little bit about looking at your garden in winter and trying to see what you can add to your garden to make it look pretty. So adding things to your winter garden would be evergreens because green, they still give us green. So there's still something to, look at but the evergreen itself gives shelter for birds so if you want to incorporate bird feeders to your property and you want to encourage more birds to come having an evergreen where they can have shelter is really important and birds in the winter add color animation to the garden as well um, but also structures sometimes an arbor with snow on them can look really good uh, a nice hedge with snow as an outline looks really good so there's many different things that we can do and even having certain plants like a snow um forgive me like a service berry that service berry has that red berry that attracts birds in the winter time that's really quite pretty as well sumac the, the 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 seed heads on the sumac really quite pretty so there's things that we can incorporate into the garden structures plantings that we can still have great garden interest and great visual appeal in the winter so it just doesn't look like a blank blank slate so i encourage you to really think about your winter garden that's out there uh this is the same question that we had about black knot uh we're gonna go right now and say good morning as well to sylvia good morning from saint Catharines, which i will be driving through later today good morning from orangeville orangeville typically gets a lot of snow as well the reason why orangeville does 
higher elevation. You're pretty much on the escarpment itself. Uh, the winds come off Georgian Bay and or off Lake Huron, northwesterlies, uh, and generally uh, places like Orangeville over towards the Dundalk Highlands, you guys get snow. You get you get some good snowfalls over that way. But Orangeville, beautiful area, great lacrosse players that come out of Orangeville. France is snowing like crazy here in Newfoundland as well. So we're seeing that as well. The rock getting some snow. So uh, And it's kind of been an exciting time of year. I had to say that this week, I had a busy week this week. I did lots of talk. I, I talked to, I spoke, forgive me, to a grade one class. And we talked about seasons and cycles. That was kind of fun. And, you know, when you talk to a bunch of adults and you say it's going to snow, adults all go, oh, no. Oh, gross. If you talk to a bunch of kids and you say it's going to snow on Sunday, they're like, yay. They're so excited. They're so excited because there's a playfulness that they see with snow. And we lose that. And, you know, we got to just kind of embrace every change that we have. We have four seasons. People from around the world come here to see snow. Crazy. I know. Crazy. Uh, replying. I love this one. I had my garlic spreads before winter and it was fine. There you go, Jane. See, there you go. Given some confidence. That's the whole idea about the community. And that's what I love about this community is that um, they're all here to help. And I also want to give a shout out to those that won tickets to the seasons show and to the Cottage, the Fall Cottage Life show. Uh, Jackie, who is the one that managed those tickets from those two shows, she's the one that does PR there. She came up and said to me, and she said, hey, your community is so great because they all send an email back thanking for the tickets and saying they got them and acknowledged. And, you know, I just want to thank all of you that did win those tickets. Uh, just thank you. Just thank you as well. Uh, here's another recommendation we have too this morning for Suzanne. Cut the disease branches off and dispose of them into the garbage, not the compost. Good point too. I said about cleaning your shears. Anytime that you have any diseased plant material, it should never go into the compost. Composts, if they work efficiently, uh, will have an internal temperature that will kill off a lot of bacteria and fungal spores and will still keep microbes in. But to be safe than sorry is where you want to discard it. And even where you're thinking about planting another cherry, if that cherry has black knot, a lot of the times I would really recommend not planting in that same location if you have the space to do so. Um, we got a snowy Rosso out there this morning as well. Uh, May, Rosso, beautiful place as well. My son loves Rosso. Uh, we got another shout out this morning as well from Marie. You're awesome. I love you and your story. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and, I, and I do have to say that, um, speaking of my story, uh, I was at the greenhouse yesterday morning uh, and actually yesterday afternoon planning for my talks. And, uh, and I was there and, and my father, I'll tell you a quick little story of my father. There is some road construction that's happening in our area. So they're going to have to remove some blue spruce and that's going to happen in the spring. And my father, uh, even though my father came to Canada, um, well, it basically went from Italy to England, England to Canada. And when they came to Canada, they had nothing. They were hired by a farmer. And so he still has this very much this resourcefulness and, and the family business has done very well, but because those spruce were going to be taken care of uh, and removed and cut down, my father got my son, because my son loves doing work on trees. Yeah, I think he may be a future arborist. My son cut down the spruce trees and then my father chopped them all up into boughs. And those boughs are what are being used in Christmas planters right now. So my father does not like to see anything go to waste, which is very sustainable. Uh, and, uh, even when it comes to eating, he does not like to see anything go to waste on his plate as well. Sometimes he fills his plate too much up, but that's all right. Good morning from well in Ontario. Good morning to you as well. But, you know, just to let you know, if you do have to do some pruning on some of your evergreens, some of those bottom boughs, as you're going out to do those prunings, those are easy additions that you can add to your Christmas planters. You know, there are many things around your own home garden that you can use in Christmas planters from berries to uh, even those dried flower heads of the hydrangeas, there are so many different things that you can use in your Christmas planters to kind of make them look your own. Uh, and it's really just a great thing. Uh, they do have to be in soil and or oasis. They should be watered when they're put in. That water will keep, keep them maintained during the winter months. Once everything freezes up, you don't have to water your urns or your Christmas planters outdoors because they are cut stems. But if things dry up and get warm again, and they become unthawed and the soil's dry or that oasis is dry, please, I encourage you to water. Um, 
Speaking of watering, uh, if you haven't as of yet, uh, if you can this week in Ontario and people watching us, Newfoundland, all the way across to the prairies as well. If you haven't turned your outdoor water taps off, I would really encourage you to. Uh, Lisa Ann is saying, woo, 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 woo. Uh, maybe that's for the snow that's coming on the way. Uh, we got a hello from Pete, Prince Edward County, which is really quite nice. Pack that is uh, just over by the Kingston area, if you're wondering where that is. Snow now in Midland, Midland, Penetanguishene, right off the shorelines of Georgian Bay. You get a tremendous amount of snow as well. Pretty, pretty community that's there. When I used to work for the new VR, now CTV2, and I was doing weather there, I can remember being in some pretty wicked snowfalls in Midland. Good morning from Kaneem. We made uh, our outdoor Canadian containers yesterday. I, You know, even today is a good time. You can do it in the garage if you wanted to today. But this is a great weekend that we can really start getting into the Christmas season, the Christmas flair. Um, just a reminder, uh, mistletoe. If you have any mistletoe that's actually fresh, alive mistletoe inside your home, that's poisonous. Um, amaryllis, the bulb itself can cause harm to some of the cats and pets and things like that. But amaryllis, planting an amaryllis right now gives you color. Great bulb. Awesome. Um, poinsettias can make cats, dogs sick. So Christmas cacti, those guys there, no worries about any, but those can outlive the average cat. They can actually, they, they live a long time. So there's many holiday plants that we're going to be bringing indoors right now and just be safe with those as well. Um, Marlene this morning, hi Frank, I planted my garlic the other day. Should I decide, would it be possible to move it in the spring? Uh, if you're going to be planting it, I would just leave it where it is. Is it possible to move in the spring while it's still dormant? Yes, you could probably move it with fairly ease, but that disturbing it too can actually throw it out of its natural cycle. Um, so I would... I would encourage you if you can to plant it in the area where it's going to stay. But I understand if you have construction, maybe you're moving, there's something else going on that you won't have that chance to. So you can risk it. You know, you have relatively good success with that is what I would say to you. Uh, I didn't know about that cracking of pots. Thank you. No problem. That's why I'm here. Just to, uh, Sometimes it's gentle reminders as well. We all need reminders. Uh, another question I have, do I need to cover a peach tree? No, Jerry, you don't need to cover a peach tree. But if you do have deer and or rabbits around the area, sometimes they'll come and chew the bottom bark of fruit trees. So you can get a, a, a wrap, which is just going to be a wrap, a plastic wrap that you wrap around the base of the tree. You can get that at your garden center, or you can even just get a piece of plastic um, drainage pipe and cut it, a slit into it and just put it on the base. That'll actually prevent that anything from chewing away. The reason why you want to get white, white reflects the light and then actually reduces the amount of drying on that tree as, as well. Uh, good morning, Frank, Lori Smith. Had a great time at the Christmas show. Thank you for the tickets. Uh, it was good to see you stopped on our way home to pick up greens to do my flower boxes on the front porch today. Awesome, Lori. It was a good time. I was so surprised at how busy, if you're thinking about the Christmas show, Christmas show is more like a marketplace. It's open today at the International Center in Toronto. You get uh, two tickets for two shows for the price of one. And the, and the, the, the show itself is the other is the fall uh, cottage life show. Busy, 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 busy. The other part about yesterday is on the back side of the International Center, what I learned was that there is a sports card show going on. So like trading cards, meaning baseball cards, hockey cards, basketball cards. And apparently a LeBron James rookie card yesterday at that show was sold for $300,000 US. Man, don't throw your kids' cards away, I guess is the lesson there. I already did. Jeez. Uh, Ania, good morning, Frankie from Millbrook. Good morning, Millbrook this morning as well. Uh, Matthew, Matthew always has a question. We'll see. Hey, Matthew, did you get the article about Michael Jake Fox and Christopher Lloyd? And I know you are a Back to the Future fan. Thanks, Matthew. I did. And thank you for sharing that article as well. I am a Back to the Future fan. I am a fan of all the 1980s movies. I was talking to those about uh, to my son and trying to encourage my son to get out there and to watch, uh, you know, Pretty in Pink. Uh, the Breakfast Club, um, some of the shows too, even in the early 90s, Reality Bites is a movie that I really liked as well. Uh, Susan out there replying as well. Good morning, Lori. Can't wait to see what you created. Uh, you know, Lori is a part of the crew and as well as Suzanne is a part, Susan that is, is a part of the crew that joined me on the uh, river cruise, the river cruise that we took this summer that was through the Netherlands. And really, we all got a great friendship out of that river cruise. And um, 
I'm going to inquire and see if I can try to figure out another cruise that we can put together because it was just a whole bunch of like-minded people that love plants and loved architecture and love food and love community that came and, uh, and also got to see some like really amazing things. And the, the Emerald Cruise Lines, I can't speak high, the, the, the Luna is just an amazing ship and just amazing overall, amazing experience. I really recommend it. Uh, Diane Green Earns, what do you put in the planter boxes before the greens? Thanks. So yeah, so what you can do is you can either just put a heavier mix of soil because you want those greens to stay upright. So if, uh, and sometimes when you do it into the soil, you'll actually have to use more greens because they'll have to be tighter in. You can go to a flower shop and you're going to get an oasis block. So the other thing too is you can fill the whole container up with soil and then just in the top part, you can then put a block of oasis. And that block of oasis, you'll want to soak the block, but you can actually put the block in and then you'll use floral tape and you'll tape the block down. The benefit of the floral oasis, even though it's a little bit more costly, is you're going to find that it actually, once you stick those stems in, they don't fall over. So you actually use less greens. A reminder, generally what we're going to do is when we're going to be building a container from scratch, a lot of the times it's best to start off if you're going to be using white birch, you start off with your white birch and then you're going to fill in around the white birch. So you're triangulating. So a lot of the times if you start with your, a lot of times people end with their height, but sometimes if you start with your height, it's really good. Another way that you can actually save money with greens is that if it's going up against the wall, you don't have to build a 360. You can actually on the back is take a larger, let's say that you had a bow of spruce and we can take a large bow of spruce and just stick it right upright so that it's flat on the back. So you're seeing the green on the front that you're looking at. You see how the green in the back of that bow is on the back. You put that large in, that actually creates a nice little canopy that's there. And then you can fill in from there. So then it can be just a one-sided uh, Christmas green because why do 360 when it's gonna be up against the wall? So there's different things that we can do to save money on the greens. Uh, and yeah, so you can either put it in soil or in a floral oasis. Those are two things. Anything that absorbs water, uh, some people use, uh, use sand. Um, sand is something that's a little harder as well to work with. I just like using, and so potting soil is a little bit loose. So I usually use a mix of potting and garden soil. I usually just get some cheaper bags of garden soil and do it in garden soil. So there you go. Boom. Um, uh, Lori Smith is Matthew again. Pussy willows work. I don't know what the question was there, but there you go. Pussies willow work. Well, pussy willows, uh, they're, they're early spring. I don't know what they were talking about, but pussy willows, if you just let, let you know, if you ever want to grow anything that's a willow, weeping willow, pussy willows, they root really easy. So cut a bunch of stems of them. And in spring, like after, don't do it now, in the spring, cut stems of them and just stick them in the ground. And if you stuck six in the ground, I guarantee you three would root and you'd actually have a new little tree. Uh, starting to snow in tiny which is right off the shorelines of Georgian Bay as well, tiny township that's out there. Good morning to you there. It's kind of exciting. I kind of get, like I'm getting in the spirit of Christmas, which is fun. I'm going to put my Christmas tree up probably next weekend. But next weekend, I have a hockey tournament on Saturday, which I'm coaching. And then Gavin has all his friends coming up on Sunday because Gavin turns 16 this week on November the 16th, champagne birthday. So if you're wondering why I'm not at BT on the 16th and 17th, I'm taking those days off because on the 16th, I'm driving my son up to get his G1, which is like his learner's permit. And then on the next day, I'm going to clean up all the mess from the birthday. Hey, Frankie, uh, the company building behind us cut through a, a root of our cedar hedge, putting it in a fence. Now it's almost completely orange leaf and empty. Is there any hope in recovering it uh, or time to rip it out and replant? So given Ashley that we are going into the winter season right now, it has been a fairly dry fall and the ground right now is still, uh, even though we had some rains, what I would do is if you do have some time today, just go out there and give them just a super deep watering. If any of the roots are exposed, make sure you cover those roots with soil. Let's just see how it overwinters. And then in spring, let's see that if it's progressed further, if it's pro progressed further into brown and it's over 50% brown, then I would remove it. If it hasn't progressed further and we're starting to see some flushes of growth in spring, I would take a look at, at um, maybe even leaving it. Most importantly for me is I'd love to see a picture. And I know, Ashley, you do have my email. 
Ashley, shout out to your son who gave me that too. Shout out to you. Um, but yeah, send me a picture and then that way I can actually have a better idea because there's nothing like a picture that's out there. I'm going to do one more uh, and away we go. Uh, good morning uh, as well. Frankie Flowers, just a random question. How long does it take for to grow an orange tree from seed? Claudette. So um, in order, like oranges in terms like the pits that we have inside our homes and if we want to grab one of those and make it into a tree itself, it can take up to four weeks for that seed to germinate. So just for that seed to sprout, four to six weeks for it to sprout, for it to grow to a significant size, it can take about three to four months. Uh, for it to become a tree, it's a couple of years that you're going to be doing that. The only thing is, is if then you grow that tree, uh, you're going to find that sometimes they will put flower on, but sometimes they won't put any fruit because many of the citrus and orange trees are, are, are actually grafted. So those grafted varieties are what are producing the oranges. So it depends on the variety of orange that you have. But it's a fun little thing that you can do. Other things you can start from seeds, which is easier, is an avocado pit. Avocado pits, you can start from seed and you can actually just uh, put some toothpicks in the avocado pit. So those toothpicks can actually, just in a cup of water, will allow just the bottom of the avocado pit to sit in water and the top not to sit in water. And that avocado pit actually sprouts very quick. You can actually take the bottom of a romaine head, after you've done the romaine, you can stick that into the ground, into soil and potting soil, and it'll actually flush some more romaine leaves that are there as well. So there's many things that we can grow from seed, from things that we actually eat and consume and just have fun. And a lot of those experiments are all about fun and all about uh, excitement, even if you have children, just so you can see something sprout, something that they can monitor, check, write down, is something that's great. So thanks for asking that question. It's a good question. We're at 31 minutes today. Um, I actually got to pack up a car and then head my way over to Two Sisters Winery. So if you're there this afternoon joining me there, we're going to be talking about some Christmas urns there this afternoon. Take a look at my social media. We'll be posting some photos and some things there as well. For all those that join me today, uh, thank you so much for your questions. If you do know some of the answers, get on there. Share your answers to those questions. Uh, FrankieFlowers.com. We're continuing to put more information on there and continuing to develop. It's just a soft launch. That uh, newsletter will be coming out the second week of December. If you haven't signed up to my newsletter, go on to frankieflowers.com, go to the bottom of the page and you'll see where you can sign up to the newsletter. Newsletter is going to have some tips and tricks and also on occasion, some giveaways. So make sure that you go there and make sure you figure out all the ways to join. And for all those that join me today, hey, health, happiness, Merry Christmas, snow is here.